today's reading is taken from Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now, becoming confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you, about all of you, since you in my heart and wherever I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. All of you share in God's grace with me. God can, can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that all your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to start looking at the book of Philippians and be looking at this letter together for the next few weeks. I love this letter as it delves into what it means to be an honest, joyful Christian community, reflecting the character of Jesus in all circumstances. It might be helpful to have Philippians open in front of you as we read. I also encourage you to maybe read through this letter once a week, each week. It's not very long, it's a bit like reading a blog. Or you could listen to it. David Suchet on the NIV Audio Bible takes 17 minutes to read through Philippians. The church in Philippi was the first community that the Apostle Paul started in Eastern Europe, which we read about in Acts 16. Lydia, the dealer in purple cloth, becomes a Christian after the Lord opened her heart to Paul's preaching. And the Philippian jailer and his whole household come to Christ after Paul and Silas are miraculously freed from prison, having been jailed for preaching about Jesus. In Acts 26, we read about Paul's journey to Rome. He'd previously been arrested in Jerusalem for preaching about Jesus sent to Caesarea by Roman governors for further questioning, which ended up lasting over two years. And then Paul appealed to Caesar, the Roman emperor, so travelled to Rome via being shipwrecked on Malta, where he remained under house arrest, awaiting trial. And there may have been a few times in Paul's life where he was under this house arrest in different cities. So it's during this time, 20 to 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus, that he wrote to many of the church communities that he had founded, to those in Philippi, to the Colossians and to the Ephesians. In the letter to the Philippians, we realise that Paul is responding to a care package that the church in Philippi had sent with a man called Epaphroditus, mentioned twice in the letter. In fact, Epaphroditus became ill and nearly died whilst he was with Paul. So Paul is especially keen to send him back to bring joy to the Philippian church. So Paul is stuck at home, not able to move about freely. Paul receives support and supplies by a visitor from friends he cannot see or go and visit. Paul's friend becomes ill and so has to stay put until he's well enough to travel again. Does that sound familiar? Now, it's important to say that this letter wasn't written to us in our current context. 
we must be careful not to bring purely our current experience as the interpretive lens that we use when we read this together. We want to find out the implications of this letter for our discipleship to Jesus. Paul was under house arrest because of persecution. He was in chains for the gospel. But this letter is still for us. As we read and discover what Paul was communicating to the Philippians, we receive it as a people in a particular circumstance of being in lockdown ourselves, of having to rediscover what it is to be Christian community, to offer the good news of Jesus in creative ways. So even if we've read and studied Philippians before, there may be a freshness we discover as we read together. Saying all of that, the opening of this letter feels so poignant to me at this point in time. Verses three to 11 show Paul's deep affection for the church in Philippi. And I think it reads like a church leader's letter or blog post that they might send to their church right now. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I pray with joy. Thanksgivings were common as an opening for ancient letters in Paul's time. And I think we should bring that back. Maybe think about how you start an email or a text to a friend or colleague this week. Paul is deeply thankful for his Philippian brothers and sisters. He is actively praying for them with joy. And he says it is right for him to feel that way since he has them in his heart. It is right that in times of distance and trial, we should feel affection for one another. I know I have. It shows that we are united by God's spirit, that we are lacking when we are not able to fully operate as one body. We share in God's grace together. So with Paul, I say to all of you today, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And I've really noticed this partnership in the gospel as I've had the opportunity to see friends in other churches in their worship online who I wouldn't normally see as I'm in our church building. Not just the really big churches that you might expect it of or with particular resources, but local churches going online for the first time. It struck me that although we often think of partnership as joining in on specific projects, and the letter does refer to financial support as well, it's also about having a generous spirit of encouragement towards one another as we all seek to share the good news of Jesus wherever we are. Our partnership in the gospel is rooted in the Holy Spirit dwelling in God's church. And I found myself in these times cheering on my brothers and sisters with renewed enthusiasm. Remembering our frontline sermon from last year, I pray that those of you in work, whether at home or on the front lines today, that you know that you're partners in the gospel. Those of you at home looking after children, you are partners in the gospel. Those of you who are having to shield because of health reasons, maybe all you can do at the minute or all you feel like you can do is pray, but you are partnering in the gospel even while at home. This week, I spoke to a couple of church leaders in Leeds to explore this theme of partnership. The whole interview can be found on our YouTube channel. After the video, we'll hear a chorus of a song that we can use to pray for our brothers and sisters that we partner with in Christ. You might want to use verses 9 to 11 of this chapter. Then we'll come back and look at the second half of chapter 1. Thank you so much, uh, Rich and Alison, for joining me on Zoom today. This is very exciting. Um, so... Uh, you guys have met today on Zoom. So Rich is one of the pastors at uh, Mosaic Church in Leeds and Alison is the vicar of um, Adel. And so we've all been uh, just sharing a little bit about what we've been doing in this time, how we've been responding and how we, although we're not directly in contact with each other all the time, how we feel this uh, sense of partnership in the gospel and we want to encourage that 
uh, today, particularly as I've been thinking about that in Philippians chapter one. Um, so Rich, how has it been at Mosaic and how have you sort of been responding to this time? How's it been for you guys? Yeah, um, I mean, it's the word that seems to be categorizing these times is strange, isn't it? And uh, it definitely feels like that. It definitely feels very strange. It feels like um, there are some immediate needs that we knew we had to be a part of meeting in the city. And for us at Mosaic, we uh, one of our services that happens every other week happens in Holbeck. Um, so we've been supporting the food bank there as we normally do. But it's the need has tripled, so it's uh, tripled in need. So obviously we've had to step up in that regard to support that to make sure there's enough to go around. Um, so we're giving into that and also into the government crisis um, pot of food, I guess, that then gets distributed where it needs to. Uh, we have a ton of key workers in the NHS across all our sites, and um, it's a privilege just to support them and see them doing what they're doing. They're doing something super unique. I can't do what they can do, uh, but I can support them as they do it and try and give them what they need as they do. Alison, how has it been in Adel? Um, well, I'm feeling slightly, not exactly, uh, slightly inspired by Alpha on Zoom because that's something I need to move into. Um, we, we've got a very mixed congregation, but uh, as you would expect in this sort of church, a fair number of elderly people. So there's been a lot of bullying of people onto Facebook uh, because we already had a Facebook group, so we decided to direct everything to Facebook as being fairly easy to get onto. Um, so... It's been a huge learning curve for me. I don't even do photos usually, never mind um, online services, but we've uh, been trying to put on at least some of the traditional services we would put on. And one lovely thing, which is nothing to do with me, has been young families writing to elderly on their own uh, members of church and oh. parishioners. And that's been lovely. And they're all saying, oh, well, when we get back to church, you can introduce us and we'll know who these people are. So that, that's been very good. I think people are up for a challenge because these are such strange times, whereas it might have taken much longer to talk them into standing in front and leading a service. Yeah. You no, know, you just say, oh, well, I can't do it all. You know, you've got a phone, could you? And people do. Yeah. So. so why don't we pray for each other now? Um, and uh, yeah, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for Alison. Lord, I thank you for all that she's doing in Adol. Uh, Lord, I just pray for that place. Um, Lord, I, I pray that there'd be many people who are um, kind of just looking up and outside of their normal sphere of where they look to uh, for answers at this time. And um, I pray that Alison would have stories to tell through this uh, when we get through the other side of this, of your your grace and your mercy affecting people's lives profoundly. Lord, we pray for Eve, for all she's doing at St George's. Yeah. We ask your blessing on her preaching. on her creativity. Thank you for the ways in which she is celebrating our partnership in the gospel. And Father, we thank you for Mosaic in Leeds. Thank you, Lord, for them reaching out at this time and acknowledging uh, the desire and the need for good news to reach people's homes. And I pray for this uh, Alpha course, Lord, that uh, people would sign up this week, that uh, Church members would invite people and be confident to invite people. Amen. Well, thank you everyone so much. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And um, yeah, it's great to pray for one another and be supportive of one another. So thank you so much for um, joining. So take my life, let it be everything all of me here i am use me for your glory in everything i say and do let my life honor you here i am living for your glory so take my life let it be everything all of me here i am 
Change me for your glory In everything I say and do Let my life honor you Here I am living for your glory This reading is taken from Philippians chapter 1, starting halfway from verse 18 to the end of the chapter. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will re continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what's happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live, in, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me, yet that shall I choose. I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for, you, for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you, Again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you have been going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. We are reminded of Paul's reasons for joy and hope, even in a time of imprisonment, in verse 19. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul's joy and hope are rooted in his certainty that his friends are praying for him and that their prayers are effective. And in the provision of the Holy Spirit, he has seen God work through his situation so that those responsible for guarding him now know of Paul's trust in Jesus. And his Christian brothers and sisters are more confident in the Lord and proclaim the gospel without fear. So are you praying for your friends at this time? Do they know that you're praying for them with joy? Do those around you, both online and offline, know of your obedience to Jesus? Are your Christian brothers and sisters, maybe your small group, more confident to share their faith when you encourage one another? Paul writes to the Philippians in verses 20 to 21 that he eagerly expects and hopes that he will not be ashamed in any way by his circumstances. Now, we might think of the emotion of shame when we read this. And it's true that trusting in Jesus removes shame as we learn and discover how much we are loved by God. But in the biblical world, shame has more of a sense of not being brought into public discredit. In other words, Paul is confident that his circumstances do not threaten the truth of the gospel. He will not be found out to be a fraud in his beliefs. In fact, he has seen that his willingness to be in chains for Christ has provoked others to ponder what life is all about. 
This eager expectation is the same as Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 19, that the whole creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Paul expects and hopes that he will have sufficient courage or complete boldness to speak about and serve Jesus. Sufficient here isn't just enough. It's completely enough. Just like Jesus' death was sufficient as a sacrifice for sins once for all. The courage and boldness here is the same words that Peter and John showed before the Jewish elders in Acts 4, even though they were unschooled, ordinary men. It's the boldness that the Holy Spirit cultivates and brings. It's the same confidence, the same word, the same confidence with which we are invited to approach the throne of grace in Hebrews 4. Paul knows that if he dies in prison, he will be with Christ forever. But if he continues to live, even in his restricted state, it is gain, gain for the Philippian church as he encourages them, gain for the gospel as he continues to preach and see people come to trust in Jesus. He cannot be separated from the love of Christ, just as we cannot. So he's simply seeking God's purposes for himself in his situation, knowing that either way, God may be glorified. In this unsettling time that we're living in, we may find ourselves questioning God or concerned that our Christian faith makes no difference to our lives. And it's okay to question, it's right and good. And it's okay to bring our concerns, our lament, our pain to God. He cares for us and he walks alongside us. The world is not as it should be. That's why we pray your will be done on earth as in heaven, as Jesus taught us. But this passage encourages me, and I hope it encourages you, that even in this time, and maybe especially in this time, especially if this is the first kind of global, big event that we have lived through, the circumstances around us do not diminish the truth of the gospel and the hope that we have in the crucified and risen Lord. We will not be ashamed. Our current circumstances, in fact, urge us to proclaim afresh the hope we have in Jesus in life and in death through our words, actions and attitudes. More people than ever are searching for meaning and purpose in this time when their supposed securities in the world have been stripped away. As Christians, we have an inheritance and a hope that can never perish, spoil or fade. And maybe today you're joining in with worship for the first time, or you've joined in online and haven't been to a physical gathering. If that's you, then you're so welcome. And I encourage you to commit your life to Jesus, the one who's made it possible to live with real, honest hope and joy forever, in right relationship with your Father in heaven, your Creator who loves you. Maybe you do follow Jesus, but you want to recommit today to ask God for that courage and boldness that the first disciples had as you live for him. Finally, in this chapter, I've been encouraged by verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. We are always and primarily called to live as free citizens of heaven in whatever circumstance or context we find ourselves in, whatever happens. And there is a freedom and an expanse here that covers all situations. Now it still takes discernment to work out what that might look like in the specifics, but the call is always the same, to love God with our hearts, soul, mind and strength and our neighbours as ourselves. So right now, that might look like staying two metres away from people, from only going shopping when we need to, to making sure that we're calling up our loved ones, our neighbours who need encouragement. 
It means to have Jesus as Lord, number one in our lives, to speak about and demonstrate his kingdom in the world, to make disciples, to serve the poor and protect the vulnerable, to turn the world upside down, ushering in God's peace and justice. Paul speaks in a similar way to the Corinthians and the Colossians, talking about food laws and about living in Christian community. We are ambassadors for Jesus, his representatives, and we all have a part to play to bring God glory in the world. Now, there may be consequences to our comfort as we represent Christ or suffering for him, as Paul puts it. But we can uphold one another in that standing firm in the one spirit, we strive together as one for the faith of the gospel. So that's Philippians chapter one. And I hope you feel encouraged. I hope you feel a longing for your brothers and sisters in Christ and a longing for the day when we can embrace and we can gather together physically. I hope you feel assured of the truth of the gospel in these times. And if you don't yet follow Jesus, I hope you'll follow along with us in this letter of joy and hope and consider putting your trust in the God who loves you, who sent his one and only son to die for you, to bring forgiveness, and who invites you even now to live your life for the glory of God.